Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Peter. Well, if you've got a Bible there, I'd encourage you to have it open to Galatians chapter 1. You might want to have it on an iPad or on your phone or something like that. Um, there'll be a few things up on the screen as we follow along as well. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there are some in the foyer. You can jump up and get them now if you want to. Um, uh, that's a new habit we're getting into. We weren't allowed to use Bibles um, in the, at church in the past, but now we can because the COVID, things, COVID restrictions have eased. Uh, you also find as you came in, there was a... In your bulletin, there's an outline for what I'll be talking about in the next 20 or so minutes. Um, and so you can follow along there. And we usually have a, qu a question and answer time or a question and comment time, whatever it might be. So we're going to aim to do that today too. So you might want to jot a few things down. If you want to ask a question, you're very welcome to at the end. So last week, we, we talked about the gospel, that's the good news about Jesus, being free and freeing. In other words, God's love for us the gospel, God's love for us, seen and explained in the gospel message uh, that Jesus died for our sins. This good news about Jesus is free. It's a free gift. Uh, forgiveness is free. We don't earn it. We can't earn it. Uh, earn it. It's a free gift. But it's also freeing. In other words, it, it frees us that we don't have to follow the ways of this world. We don't have to love the things of this world because God loves us. What's more important than that? That's freeing. It takes the, the load off, you could say. Now, if you missed uh, last week, um, actually, let's say one more thing about last week before I tell you about that. La um, we, we saw that the gospel is free and freeing, yet these Galatians, you might remember, if you hear these Galatians, uh, were turning to a different gospel. And Paul's astonished in verse 6 of chapter 1. He's astonished. He's a little bit fiery, a bit, of ang bit angry as well. He's astonished that they're turning to a different gospel. It's a gospel plus. So it's a, well, yeah, okay, Jesus is great. I love Jesus. Great, fantastic. But you need to do these things as well. And the Apostle Paul here says, the Bible says to us today that that's no gospel at all. That's not God's message of, of, of the free gift of salvation. When you add something to it, it's not a gospel at all. Okay, so now if you missed that last week, what you can do, you can actually catch up. You don't have to miss a sermon anymore. So you can catch up by searching on YouTube for our YouTube channel, uh, Robertson Burrowing Anglican Church, and you can see we're actually videoing right now. We're videoing this sermon. So hello to you watching at home. Hello to you if you missed this. You can watch it at home. Um, so uh, you can catch up there. All right, how about I pray and ask God to help us for the next few minutes. Father, we thank you for this, your word to us today. Uh, we pray that you'd speak to us. Uh, you, you pray that you, we, we would pray that you would um, open our hearts and make us be real with you. And uh, Lord, we, um, we thank you for this time together. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, isn't it great to hear the story of God's grace in people's lives? Uh, you can, as I said, you can ask Peter a bit more about his story as well. And maybe you've had a chance to talk to people over the past however many weeks. We've talked about gospel conversations quite a lot, haven't we? Um, and asking people where they're at with God and how God has worked in their lives. Uh, Beck actually shared um, in the 8 a.m. service about uh, God working in her life too, so you can ask her about that. But I encourage you to, uh, if you've got a Christian friend, talk to them about God's grace in their lives, but it's good, it's good to hear that. Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 to 24, is Paul sharing about the grace of God in his life. The old-fashioned word is testimony. You might remember that word. It's a, that's what Paul's doing. He's sharing his testimony about God's grace in his life. Now, it's part of a longer autobiographical section in Galatians. It sort of starts at 1 verse 10 and goes through to 2 verse 21, if you've got your Bible in front of you there. Actually, it's one of three occasions where Paul uh, speaks of or shares his story. You can read it again in Acts 22, Acts 26. He shares his story. Our question this morning is, why does he share his story here in Galatians chapter 1? Why does he do it here? Well, it's actually not for general inspiration. Uh, quite often in church, we would do that, would share our story for general inspiration. It's a good thing, like Peter did before. But it's not on this occasion, and nor is it to point... Well, he doesn't share his story to point to himself. He doesn't do that. No, no, no. He's sharing his story here to refute the claims of people who want to undermine his message. There are people in Galatia who want to undermine Paul's message, the gospel. So he's sharing his story to refute those claims and he wants it all 
to point to the amazing grace of God. So, on your outline there, it's point one in your outline, Paul's defence. You see, Paul is defending himself from three attacks uh, from some people. That's the people he refers to in uh, verse 7. And these people, were, these people were making attacks on him and his gospel message. So, here's his first defence. Paul wants uh, to make it clear that his gospel did not come about through his own reflection, reasoning and thinking. So it wasn't as if Paul was sitting under some fancy tree, you know, spending some time under the tree and contemplating life and its meaning and all that. And finally, after such great, uh, this deliberation, uh, it dawned on him, ha, the meaning of life. It wasn't like that at all. He tells the Galatians, as if they needed any reminding, that prior to his conversion, he was intensely, see verse 13? He was intensely hostile to the church and Christianity. He wanted to destroy it. Don't, don't water down that word. He wanted to destroy it. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that meant in a few moments. This was not a gradual process of thinking, weighing things up and discussion. His change happened suddenly. He was going this way, I want to destroy the church. And then when he, when he was met by the Lord Jesus on that Damascus road, his life turned around, he was going this way and he wanted to grow the church. It was very, very different. Things happened suddenly. Paul's message was not the product of his own thinking. It was radical, uh, radical, sudden change of direction. I'm going one way, turned, Jesus met him and he went another way. Paul's conversion was ex the exact polar opposite of where he'd been going. So Paul's experience then of sudden change is strong evidence that his conversion was actually from God. It was a direct revelation from God when the risen Jesus met him personally, uh, physically, just like the other apostles on the road to Damascus. What about this second reason, this second defence of Paul? Paul wants, to, he wants, Paul wants to undermine the claim that he got together with the Jerusalem leaders, colluded with them and came up with his gospel message. So let's, if you've got your Bible there, have a look at um, Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. And you, you'll see what I mean. Uh, but when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see uh, those who were apostles before I was, but I returned immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So, so next, he actually points out that there was three years three years but between his conversion and his first visit to Jerusalem. So look at verse 18. We'll read 19 as well. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with, with Peter and stayed with him just 15 days. Interesting, isn't it? I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. You see what he's doing? In other words, Paul, is not, Paul didn't get his message from headquarters. That's what he's saying. He didn't, get it from, he didn't get it from headquarters uh, so he could toe the party line. You know how politicians do that. Um, I'm sure they have their meetings early morning or they get a text around or what do they get and they have to remain on script with the other front benches. It's, it gets tedious after a while. They're sort of like a bunch of robots saying the same thing no matter where they are in the country. They've all got the memo. Well, it's not like that with Paul. No, no, he didn't go to headquarters. He didn't go to Jerusalem. He didn't speak to the other apostles. In fact, it took him a long time to get to the other apostles. And he writes that here so that we would know that his message, the gospel message, is from God and he wasn't colluding with other, other, other people, other, other leaders. Now, if he did, let's just put that scenario out for a minute. If he did collude with these other Jerusalem leaders, well, this would enable that, those, those who oppose him to argue, well, we have also been trained at Jerusalem headquarters. We've been there. And we know that Paul did not give you the whole story. There are other things you must do to please God. So Paul wants to make it clear there was no towing the party line. There was no colluding with the headquarters, Jerusalem leaders, to get the story straight. No, no, no. This message that he received was from God, not from man. However, however, Paul's still keen to point out that his God-given gospel got the tick of approval from the other apostles and what they received from God. 
So Peter, he's mentioned. He stayed a couple, was it a couple of weeks with Peter? Yep, 15 days. And, and James, the Lord's brother, and then churches, churches of Judea, uh, Judea were among those who praised God for the message he had been given, uh, message God had been given Paul. So there was no commissioning from the other apostles, but Paul's message was not uh, contrary to what the other apostles received. All part of his defence against those opposers who wanted to undermine his message. Well, Paul's story doesn't only establish his authority as a gospel teacher, that his story, come, his message is, is God-given, not, not from man. But it also, uh, his story also illustrates some aspects of what his gospel of grace, or this gospel of grace is. This grace is the foundation of every step of the Christian life. So Paul's story is an example of just that. Paul keeps coming back to grace, this unmerited favour of God that we don't deserve. He keeps coming back to grace time and again. And I want to say, so should we. So should we. In our lives, our prayers, our thoughts, speaking to others, preaching and teaching. So we're going to spend a couple minutes... Uh, a few minutes, just, just having a look at the God, the God of grace at work in Paul. Let's we'll have a look at his story and see what sort of guy he was and how God changed him. And I tell you, it's a great encouragement for us to do this. So let's ask this question first then, who, was, who Paul was? Short answer, uh, and then I'll give you the long one. Woohoo! Um, <laughs> the short answer is, he's a man need of, in need of grace. Now, the long answer. <laughs> Paul was a man who did terrible things. Terrible things. So he persecuted the church of God. He did that. His aim was to destroy the church. And he did that by killing people. Murdering people. Watching people being murdered. That's how he did it. It wasn't some political thing going on. He was very... Brute force was his style. He did it by killing people. That's the sort of man he was. Even on the very day that Jesus appeared to him on the, that road to Damascus. That very day he was, on his, he was on his way to destroy God's people. He was on his way to, to take people into prison. Now, if you get a chance later on, read Acts chapter 9. It's the first couple of verses. But Acts chapter 9 verse 1 tells us that he had just been in Jerusalem breathing out murderous threats against Christians and, and seeking the high priests. So he went to the top the high priest's approval to imprison men and women in Damascus because that's where he was heading. Men and women in Damascus who belonged to the way. Now, that was the way that, that was what Christianity was called back then. That's what he was doing. He was on his way to Damascus with the high priest's approval to throw Christian men and women in jail and possibly kill them as well. That's what he was doing when Jesus appeared to him. And yet... Well, Paul was also a very religious man. He was a very religious man. He did many religious deeds. Galatians 1 verse 14, if you've got it in front of you, Paul says, I was advancing in Judaism before many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. And yet, he was not right with God. See, Paul's a classic example classic example of a person who was sincere in his misdirected beliefs before becoming a Christian. Friends, I want to tell you, sincerity does not save. It does not make you right with your creator. You can be as sincere as you want, it does not make you right with your creator. Paul was exactly that. You can be sincerely wrong. You can be consumed with religion or perhaps consumed with experience and emotion and miss Jesus. Well, so far in this letter, you see, we haven't been told the exact nature of this false teaching that was going about in Galatia. These gospel plus Judaizers that we met last week, that's what the commentators call them, uh, who were trying to pervert the gospel, Paul writes. But in verse 14, if you've still got it open, there's a hint. Because later in chapter 2, 3 and 6, you can read it later on, but later we do read that these people 
uh, who were these people trying to convince new Christians that they had to keep all the Old Testament traditions to be pleasing to God, including diet, dress, and circumcision. Well, what, see what Paul's saying here in verse 14. He's saying, I've been there, done that. You know that expression? Yeah, been there, done that. Usually comes up in a negative way. You know, um, I've made that mistake. Then you, someone says, oh yeah, been there, done that. Well, that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, yeah, been there, done that. Uh, and it doesn't work. I've done all the Old Testament stuff. I've done all, the, all the, the, the diet, dress and circumcision stuff. I've kept all those laws. In fact, I was, what do you say? I was, uh, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. I was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. I've been there, done that. It doesn't work, Paul says. It doesn't work. Sincerity, religious sincerity doesn't work you can make yourself you cannot make yourself acceptable to god by being by being sincere alone or by being the most zealous follower of the law see before his conversion paul was filled with pride He'd go to the high priest and say i want to kill christians high priest would say you go for it <laughs> uh, he was filled with pride that he was so good at it yet despite his do-it-yourself religious efforts despite his pride God saved him. God saved him. Despite all that, God saved him. And he even called him to be a preacher and teacher of the faith. His story is a powerful witness to the God of grace. That grace, the grace that is free, unmerited favour of God, that God loves you irrespective of who you are, irrespective of what you've done. That God's grace working powerfully, it works powerfully to change lives. There's no clearer example than Paul that we are saved by grace alone, not through good morals, not through religious performance or sincerity. Paul's sins were very, very deep, but God still invited him in. I'm reading a, a great little book on Galatians by a guy called Tim Kelly, he's an American preacher, you know, writer, a pastor, and... Um, he, he says that uh, Paul's story teaches us that no one is so good that they don't need the grace of the gospel, nor is anyone so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. It's good, isn't it? Let me say it again. No one is so good that they can't receive that, that they don't need the grace of the gospel, and nor is anyone so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Uh, some of the our regulars know I used to work in prisons ministry. And I was reminded of that day in, day out, when I shared the gospel with guys who'd killed people, raped people, uh, drugs and murder and so on. Um, and they turned to Jesus because the, the Bible says, Paul's story tells them that no one is so bad they can't receive the grace of the gospel. Okay, well, as, well, as Paul looks back, um, he, he can actually see, a bit like what Peter was sharing before and what Beck shared at 8 o'clock too, if you're a Christian person, you can often look back and see God working in your life and just, just, just see little things going on um, before your actual conversion, you could say. Perhaps your story is a, bit, a little bit like that. Uh, if you think about your story of how you've got to know Jesus, how did the grace of God work in your life over time? In my story, I certainly look back and I see certain people, I see teachers at a school I was at um, who I pretty much ignored and probably created issues with them, poor people. Um, but they loved me and looked after me and they prayed for me. Uh, I shared at 8 o'clock a, a lady um, uh, who I only saw recently at my godfather's funeral. Her name's Jean. Jean has been praying... For, she's mum, one of my mum and dad's friends. Uh, Jean has been praying for me, oh, I think, since I was born. So that's like 21 years. Um, <laughs> not quite. Um, <laughs> uh, but man, Jean's a legend and every time I see her at family events or whatever, probably only one, once every two years um, she's probably in her 80s now um, she says, oh, I've been praying for you Graham and mum and dad, my mum and dad keep, keep uh, her up to date I can see the grace of God working in my life through people like that uh, and, and other people and I'm deeply thankful for them so Paul writes in verse 15 but when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, called me by his grace. See, Paul's point is that God has been shaping and preparing him all his life for the things God was going to, going to call him to do. Isn't that incredible? 
If you're a Christian person, God, God's been shaping. He might be doing that now. He's shaping and, and, uh, and, and preparing you. God is, uh, Paul had been resisting God and doing so much wrong for such a long time that God intervened. God interrupted his life by his grace. Uh, no wonder Paul writes of God's immense patience in saving him. It's a great passage. I'll just read it to you from 1, um, uh, from 1 Timothy. It's up on the screen there. Uh, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, Paul writes. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. As an example, for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. That's Paul's story. Paul's story is an example of of God's patience with you and I and him and Paul, I should say. So Paul is an example to remind us of of God's grace and patience, to remind us that no one is so good that they don't need the the grace of the gospel and that no one is so bad that they can't receive the grace of the gospel. I reckon that the grace of God, God's unmerited favour, his love for us, hangs on those little two words. Uh, There's one, but, (laughs) but. And back in uh, chapter uh, Galatians 1 verse 15, it's but when God... Two words or one phrase that, that are so full of God's grace. But when God. I'll give you one more example. It's in Titus 3. Uh, and you see if you can see the but when. All right. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Okay, that's me before I became a Christian. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when... The kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared. He saved us not because of our, the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. You see the but when? There it is. Uh, just the end there. But when? They are the words that summarise the gospel. But when God? The gospel message is a message of a great rescue mission. God intervened in the life of Paul and he intervenes in our lives and all believers with that little word, But. <laughs> But when God, I saw a great movie. Just um, oh, it's 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 on. You know, I was about to say DVD, but that makes me feel old. Uh, it's not DVD at all, is it? You know, whatever it is, Netflix. Um, <laughs> it's called All Is Lost. I don't know if you've seen it. I'm going to ruin it for you. I'm going to give you the ending. I'm sorry, but the illustration doesn't work otherwise. I think it's still worth watching if you know the ending. Great movie. It's got one actor in it, Robert Redford. One actor. Uh, And he plays this older man who's deep into a solo sailing voyage across the Indian Ocean. Uh, It's a... What's the word? I haven't written my notes. But but it's a really creepy, um, epic sort of adventure. Anyway, the title of the film sort of gives it away in some ways to to understand what happens. Um, Again, spoiler alert, sorry. But he ends up alone. He sort of starts alone, but very alone. Alone with no communications. In fact, what happened was that he was on his own sleeping, beautiful, lovely day, in the ocean, dead calm, and he runs into a, a shipping container full of um, joggers. <laughs> it's quite funny, they all spill out in the ocean. This boat gets torn apart, big hole in the hull, water splashes in, and that actually means that, that his communications are, are gone. And it's the first of many disasters that happen as he, well, he just loses control of what's going on uh, and he's lost. And in the end, it's his mariner's intuition and strength that really belies his age. Uh, He's just hanging on as this mother of all storm hits him and he he gets capsized over and over again. Eventually, though, his boat goes down uh, and he has to rely on a flimsy life raft and an old sextant, you know, those things that work with the shadows and so forth, uh, and the sun, nautical maps to chart his progress. He has, he's forced to rely on this flimsy life raft that's falling apart day after day, uh, and it's looking more and more bleak. Ocean currents carry him eventually into a shipping lane, which he's thankful for, but three times he lets off flares and the ships go sailing by. He can't be seen. The sun is relenting, uh, unrelenting, and at one point sharks circle his little life, life raft. His supplies are dwindling, and uh, 
he, he really, he stares mortality in the face. He's going to die and he knows it. The final scene um, is, is epic, I think. Still worth watching. I don't want to spoil it, but it's still worth watching. So his flares have run out. Uh, his life raft is sinking. The passing ships don't see him. He has nothing, nothing left in the middle of the ocean and he sinks. All is lost. And slowly he descends to the depths. You see him go down. Down he goes. But then, <laughs> but then there's a rescue. There's some lights in the distance, a boat, and then it's shot really beautifully. A hand comes down and grabs him and brings him up. Uh, right, at the, right at the moment he needs it. Friends, I reckon that's the gospel of the God's grace that we read in the Bible. That's the message of Jesus. Jesus is our saviour. He saves us. He's appeared and he reaches down and he grabs us when all is lost. But we're no longer lost because we've grabbed him. We're found, using Jesus' words. Uh, we're rescued. We're given life. I love it. But when God... Now, has, has God done that in your life? I, I want to say, don't let his rescuing hand slip you by. Reach out today and be saved, forgiven, set free. You might be thinking, well, why does God save? Why? If he's really the creator of the universe, we're just those little, you know, nothing really. Why does he save us? Why did he save Paul? Well, the hint is in verse 15. It says that God was pleased to save Paul. God set his loving grace on believers, not because they're worthy of it. Uh, was Paul pleasing to God in any way? No. <laughs> God loves us simply because he loves us. He wants to say he's pleased to save us. It gives him pleasure. And friends, this is the only kind of love that we can ever be securing since it is the only kind of love we cannot possibly lose, that is grace. Well, I was going to spend a few moments just in the last outline there, how the gospel changes us. It changed Paul uh, in terms of he started preaching, and then we can read more in Acts actually about what changed Paul. But we're going to spend the next few weeks in Galatians understanding what, how the gospel of grace changes us. So I won't say any more about that. But let's tie a few things together, and then we'll have a bit of a time for questions. Paul's story shows us, once again, remember this phrase, that no one is so good that they don't need the, gra the grace of the gospel and no, nor is anyone so bad they can't receive the grace of the gospel. No one is beyond the reach of God's amazing grace. This message that comes only from God. The gospel is not some good advice made up by a bunch of people sitting under a tree. Uh, it is good news from God. And I want to encourage you today to rejoice in that good news, that gospel. In Jesus Christ, you'll find what your heart has always longed for. This is what one, one author wrote. I thought it's great. I'll read it out in four, then I'll close. No other love is this great. No other hope is this secure. No other forgiveness is this complete. No other joy is this deep. No other freedom is this liberating. No other peace is this sweet. All of it is found in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Do you know this Saviour, the fountain of saving grace, and the author says here, come and drink. How about I pray for us? If you've got a question or a comment, um, you're welcome to ask. Let's, let's pray. Father, well, I want to th thank you today that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. Thank you that in him you showed us your love, that unmerited favour. Lord, as we trust in you, Lord Jesus, we know we're forgiven. We thank you that our sin is dealt with on the cross. Lord, we pray that today we respond uh, maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, whatever it might be, we respond and trust you and give our lives over to you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.